Welcome to the river. Before I get into the sermon, let me address three things. First of all, I want to mention the unrest that is currently happening in Minneapolis and across the country. Hopefully you've already seen my video devotional from this past week where I talk about the death of George Floyd and connect injustice and suffering with what we read in Habakkuk 1, 2 through 4. If you have not seen that, you can still find it on our Facebook page as well as on our YouTube channel. As the events of this past week have unfolded, I have found myself noticing the, the social media posts of a friend of mine, Dr. Kelvin Walker. Yesterday on our Facebook page, I reposted one of his recent posts where he talked about some of the ways that we can respond in the midst of times like this. And I wanna share with you something that he wrote. He said, hope with me that Jesus will return soon and right every unjust and racist action that has taken place in the world. Until then, we lament, we speak out, we challenge unjust systems, actions, and attitudes, and we long for the day where life will be here on earth as it is in heaven. With that in mind, let me pray for our city and for our country. Heavenly Father, we do long for that day when things will be here on earth as it is in heaven. But until that day, Lord, we live in a sin-cursed world where injustice and suffering and pain and death and trouble happens, Lord. May you give us wisdom in knowing how to process all this and how to handle it and how to be involved and to be, to be your hands and feet. Lord, I pray specifically for the family of George Floyd in the midst of their pain and their grief. And I pray specifically for the communities where the violence is breaking out. I pray for peace. I pray for justice. I pray for you to be glorified and for your kingdom to come and your will to be done. I pray for you to bring healing in this land like only you can do. And I pray for us that we would know how to be involved. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The second thing that I want to mention is that yesterday I sent out our plans for an in-person Sunday morning service. That's right. Beginning June 21st, we will be on site at our location with a simple, flexible outdoor option. And at the same time, we will continue to offer everything that we have already been offering online because we know that not everyone and really many people will not be able to join us in person. We want to continue to offer this but we also wanna have that option available. The details for all of this have been sent out to our uh, Facebook group as well as um, to our email list. And if you did not receive that, please send me an email at riveralliancechurch at gmail.com and we will get that to you. The third thing I wanna mention is that at the end of today's sermon, I have embedded a short video from Chris O'Dell. So many of you know Chris and Jamie and their kids, and they are part of our River Extended family around the world. Uh, they are serving in Taiwan with a coffee shop ministry called The Aroma. And in this video, Chris shares about how things are going for them in the midst of the pandemic and how we can continue to pray for them and partner with them in the midst of all of, all of this. So I encourage you to stick around and to watch that message at the end of the video. Now, as we move on to our sermon, let me pray for our time together today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to be together, even if it is still online at this point. Um, may you be with me as I share your message. Help me to be attentive to what you want me to say. And may you help us all to receive whatever it is you want for us in the midst of this. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So for our opening illustration today, I thought I would talk about pizza. Now, many of you probably know that I love pizza. However, not just any pizza. So I grew up in New York and my favorite pizza is that New York style with a thin and chewy crust where you, those giant oversized slices that you fold and like all that cheese is making grease just kind of run off. I know that, that is so good. I, I, I could just taste the slice right now. Now, with all that said, I'm still okay with non-New York style pizza. I even like frozen pizza. It's just that all of that other pizza that is not New York style, I kind of treat it like it's a different food group. For instance, my favorite kind of New York style pizza is plain cheese. I, I don't want all the toppings. I think the truest form of pizza is cheese pizza because if the pizza itself is so good, then you don't need the toppings. However, 
while I prefer plain cheese pizza in New York style, from other places like those pizza chains, my preference is Supreme. Do you know what I'm talking about with Supreme? That's where they have all the toppings on it, like sausage and pepperoni and black olives and green peppers and all of that. So let me ask you this. What do you think they mean when they call it Supreme? So Merriam-Webster's online dictionary says Supreme means highest in rank or authority or highest in degree or quality. It's the ultimate. It is superior. Okay, but have, ever, have you ever been to some of those pizza places where, who have not only a Supreme pizza, but they also have Super Supreme, which would technically mean that it is even better than the highest quality that they offer, which makes no sense, right? It's almost like they think that Supreme simply means more, like, like Supreme means lots of toppings. And a Super Supreme would therefore be even more toppings than the Supreme. But that's not what Supreme means. More is not necessarily better. Supreme means the highest quality, so there can be nothing better. Sometimes I think our culture kind of takes the meaning out of words. It, it kind of confuses things, you know? Today, we're going to look at a passage that is sometimes referred to as the supremacy of Christ. And when we think of the supremacy of Christ, I don't want any confusion. So in this context, I want to make sure that, it, that we recognize that it means that we're referring to him as being superior, uh, having the highest rank, uh, being preeminent above all. Okay, so now that we've cleared that up, please turn within your Bibles to the book of Colossians chapter 1. For this week, we dig into one of my favorite books in the Bible, and one once again, that makes it, so since it is one of my favorite books, it makes it hard to choose just one passage to preach from. If you've never read the book, I encourage you to go back and read it. It is a short book, but it is filled with such rich reminders of who Christ is and what he has done for us. Before we dig into our passage for today, let's start with a little background. What do you know about Colossians? So this is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Colossae, which was located in the Lycus Valley near two other towns you may have heard of, Laodicea and Hierapolis, and today would be in modern-day Turkey. It's not a town that is mentioned as being along one of Paul's missionary journey, journeys as mentioned in Acts. Many scholars believe that Paul actually probably um, uh, planted this church as well as other churches in the Lycus Valley during his time in Ephesus, which is only about 100 miles away. Acts 19 actually mentions a two-year period during Paul's time there where he ministered to the province of Asia. This letter to them was written while Paul was in prison, most likely in Rome around AD 62. Paul wrote the letter because Epaphras had arrived from Colossae with some news about some heretical teaching that was happening in the church there. Now, um, the heresy most likely revolved around what would become known as Gnosticism. Now, we don't have time to go into all of what they believed, but basically it was a philosophy that was based on knowledge that was gained through mystical experience. And it taught that matter was evil, that God did not create the world, that the incarnation never happened, that, that God's connection to the world came uh, through a hierarchy of powers of which Jesus was just one, as well as some other things. So in particular, their view of Christ was a problem. And throughout this letter, Paul deals with that by sharing the truth about who Christ is and what he has done. And we see that right away in our passage for today. So let's pick things up with verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Do you see how Paul is directly confronting the heretics with these verses? Now there's a lot here, so let's start breaking this down. What does it mean that the Son is the image of the invisible God? Think about this. God is the creator of all that we know. We can see evidence of him in his creation. The book of Romans speaks of how his invisible qualities, like his divine power, can be recognized in all that he has made. But while we can look at the world around us and see evidence that God does exist, he himself is invisible to us. 
Paul says here that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. This is speaking of who Jesus is. The word used here for image carries with it two things, likeness and manifestation. Christ bears the likeness of God and manifests his nature. He doesn't just show us what God looks like. He is God. And so when he came to earth, God was revealing himself to us. The invisible became visible. Paul then goes on to refer to him as the firstborn of all creation. What does he mean by that? So that word firstborn means first in time and first in rank. And both of those things fit with Christ. So he is pre-existent, which means that Jesus doesn't just show up at, at, in the Gospels, nor does he even just show up at the beginning of creation. He existed before creation. He was the first one. He was before even creation. Now, not only is he before creation, but he's also supreme over creation. And remember, when we, we use that word supreme, we're not talking about lots of toppings. We're talking about being superior. He is being over all. Um, he is first in rank. Now, in verse 16, Paul goes on to say that not only did Christ exist before creation, but all of creation was created through him and for him. Now, is that what you think of when you think of creation? It's funny. I think when we think of creation, we tend to picture God the Father being at work and not really consider the Trinity as being involved. But here, Paul clearly points out that all things were created through and for Christ, which is similar, by the way, to what we read in the Gospel of John. Notice also that Paul specifically points out thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities. What do you think he means by all of that? This speaks of Christ's authority over all realms, physical and spiritual, natural and man-made, good and evil. Christ has authority over everything. There is no earthly king who does not come under his reign. There is no spiritual force that does not submit to him. There is no power greater than he is. He is Lord of all. This would have directly confronted the heretics in what they were saying. Notice also in verse 17, Paul says that Christ is before all things and that in him all things hold together. What do you think that means? So we've talked about Christ's pre-existence, his involvement in creation, and his supremacy over all things. This verse specifically speaks to Christ's sustaining power and authority. Now let me put it this way. We tend to think of there being rules about how the universe operates, right? like the laws of gravity and motion and thermodynamics and things like that. My son loves that kind of stuff. He's into math and physics and everything, and, and he studies that. I don't understand a lot of it. Scientists, though, believe that the laws govern the way this universe works. I mean, it makes sense when you think about how life on this planet is, has to be in like this intricate balance. Everything needs to work out perfectly. Um, if, if the earth rotated any faster, if we are any closer to the sun, or if there was some change to the moon, all of that kind of stuff would, would, would um, directly relate to whether or not life could even be sustained here on earth. I get that. Everything is held in this intricate balance. But while the laws might help define what is happening, that does not mean that the laws themselves govern. The laws themselves are not what is holding us together. Life on this earth is not an accident. It didn't just happen. And if something changed, if a huge asteroid were to hit the earth or the sun were to stop shining or the magnetic poles were to shift or if some global pandemic destroyed half the world's population, none of it would happen without going through Christ's hands first. And we need to understand that. He has the authority. He is the sustainer of all that we know. Over 100 years ago, J.B. Lightfoot put it like this, because of his care for the unity of the world, it exists as a cosmos instead of a chaos. Paul then moves on to narrow his focus into Christ onto Christ's followers. Let's pick things up with verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now, what does Paul mean when he says that Christ is the head of the body? So the body is a common metaphor that Paul uses to speak of the church. 
The, the Greek word for church is ecclesia, which means assembly and refers to all believers for all time. Not just the church in Colossae, but us as well, a couple of hundred, a, a couple of thousand years and miles away from where Paul said these words. We too are the church. All followers of Christ together make up one body of which Christ is the head. We're like a living organism uh, made up of different parts or different members, as Paul speaks of elsewhere, who minister to one another. And together we display God to this world. You've heard it said that we are Christ's hands and his feet. Literally on this earth, he uses us to minister to others. Paul then says that Christ is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. What does he mean by those words? So Christ not only created us and became like us and then died for us, but he also rose again, defeating sin and death and making it possible for his followers to look forward to a day when we too will rise again and be welcomed into his eternal kingdom. Christ rose first and paved the way for our resurrection. Now, verses 19 and 20 summarize a gospel reminder for us. This is saying that Christ is God the Son who came to earth and through his death on the cross made peace between man and God, restoring our relationship with him. Isn't that beautiful? Now, Paul continues to speak on what this means for us in verses 21 to 23. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. So what do you think it means that we were once alienated from God? Do you remember earlier I spoke of how in creation, God's eternal attributes like his divine power are visible to us even though he himself is invisible? That comes from Romans 1. That passage goes on to say that even though that is true, man chose not to honor God or to give thanks to him, but chased after his own plans and exchanged the truth about God for a lie, worshiping creation rather than the creator. A couple of chapters later in Romans chapter 3, Paul sp speaks of man's sin nature and how we are all sinners and how that sin separates us from God. We have been alienated from God by our sin. Verse 22 says that God chose to reconcile us to himself through Christ. Do you know what the word reconcile means? So the word specifically used here speaks of transforming something, changing something from one state to another. For instance, in verse 22, it speaks of changing our relationship with God from enmity to friendship, like a complete change. Mankind was alienated from God, and yet God chose to come to earth to die on a cross so that man's sin could be forgiven and we could have a restored relationship with him. That's what this is saying. He then goes on in verse 22 to say that he did this to present us holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. What do you think that means? It means that when we come to Christ and receive him as our savior, all of our sins, all of our wrong thoughts and bad motives and everything else are washed away so that we are without blemish, free from accusation. And that's a powerful and awesome statement. Now, I enjoy watching courtroom dramas on TV. Imagine being in a heavenly courtroom where all of our sins, everything we've ever done is listed out word for word. Here's what Rob is guilty of. Line after line of every wrong word, every broken promise, every lustful thought, every angry response, every deed that I have ever done listed one by one. And Satan is there accusing and pointing out all these things, uh, making these accusations against me of which I know I am guilty. It's all true. I'm a sinner. But in that heavenly courtroom, Christ stands up and he takes us back to the cross where his blood was spilled and points to that moment 
when he brought me to himself and allowed me to know him as my savior. And he points out that the charges against me have been covered by his blood so that I am clean. And I stand before God without blemish, free from accusation. That's the gospel. Paul then wraps all of this up with a challenge in verse 23 to continue in that faith, to stand firm and not move from that gospel. He is directly confronting the heretic, saying, why would you give all this up for that? This is a good reminder for us to stand firm in the amazing message of the gospel. So like I said, this is a powerful passage. Before I give you one closing thought, what are you going to take from this? I think what stands out to me most from this passage is how the gospel is unlike anything else. Paul, think about this. Paul spent the early part of this passage talking about the supremacy of Christ, how he is above all and he created all and he is before all and he is over all and he is sustainer of all. All of this amazing stuff about how Christ is supreme. And yet this supreme God, the son, came to earth to pay the penalty to reconcile us to himself. Think about that. All other religions focus on what man needs to do to reconcile themselves to a supreme being that they worship. But Christianity is all about God pursuing us, paying the penalty himself to bring us back to a right relationship with him. Wait a second. I think I have a graphic here for us. This is mind blowing. From an earthly perspective, it makes no sense. This all supreme God, the son did this for us, for me. That's the gospel. I wanna encourage us to try and wrap our minds around this truth and to let it grow in us as we consider the supremacy of Christ and all that he did. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is amazing truth that you, the, the supreme God, the Son, would come to earth to die for me. It is mind-blowing. I am amazed at what you have done for me. May you help the truth of your gospel to sink in to my life as I recall who you are and what you have done for me. And may that change they, then the way that I look at life and live. May you be glorified in me, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as I mentioned earlier, here's the video from Chris O'Dell. Hey, church fam. I want to thank you for your partnership in the gospel. My name is Chris, and I'm here in Taiwan serving with the Christian Missionary Alliance at Aroma Cafe church and with the short-term teams that we host and interns through Envision. I just want to give you a quick update today on some of the amazing things that God's doing here in Taiwan. Even though life has been a little bit different because of coronavirus, we still by and large have had a lot of our freedom and been able to continue the ministry here. I'm so thankful that God has given us that. But I will say that it's been tough in some ways, particularly with our business. And we have this cafe. The hope is that the business would be able to pay many of the bills here. And that more importantly than that, that it would be a place where people can come in and smell the aroma of Christ. But more people are staying at home these days because they want to stay safe and protect others from the virus. And so our sales have gone down a little bit. It's been a tough challenge, but what I've seen in this is that God is faithful. As we've been praying about it, we've seen God provide in some pretty cool ways. One is that a semi-famous band from the city rented out our space for a day, paying two and a half times what a recent day of sales has averaged to be able to rent out the space and record a video they wanted to make. Man, that was such an encouraging blessing. Also, they posted about us on social media, which 
allowed other people to get to know about our cafe that maybe hadn't known yet. It's really encouraging. We're so thankful that God has provided us this opportunity. It's really cool. And I've also been thinking and praying about business and wondering what the future is going to look like. One thing I love about our God is that he wants to be so intimately involved in all the aspects of our life, not just church on Sunday. If you think God is limited to church on Sunday or you only put him in that box, then you're only going to receive that blessing from him in that small space. So I want to challenge you to think about the different, the darker places of your life, the harder places of your life where maybe it feels like God's not evident there to remind yourself that he is. Just like Nehemiah, when he first went back and saw the walls of the city were torn down, it says he rose in the middle of the night and he surveyed everything and he made his plan and God helped him, gave him the strength and the courage to work the plan. And Nehemiah was successful at doing something in just a few short days, something that took, I think it was 50 something days, something that took 70 years and they still couldn't figure it out. God supernaturally empowers us when we rise in the night. So what is the difficult night situation that you're facing right now? Invite God into that situation. Get up, rise and shine like it says in Isaiah, and let's conquer this night together because it's our destiny to be the people that rise and that shine. I wanna thank you for partnering with us in the gospel. Thank you for being the kind of people that rise and shine in the middle of the nighttime situations. Please pray for us in the cafe as we continue to rework the business and see what that's gonna look like to help more people smell the aroma. Pray for the church as we focus on discipleship and raising up more Taiwanese leaders in this next season. And pray for us that even though we can't host any short-term teams this summer, that the ministry of the gospel would continue to go forth into places around the city and the nation because God's faithful. Even when we don't know how he's working, he's always working. Go rise and shine in the night. Let's pray together. Thank you. As I said earlier, Chris and Jamie and their kids are part of our River Extended family. I encourage all of us to be praying for them and to be considering ways God might want to use us in their lives. If you would like to know more about uh, what's going on there, or if you want to talk about ways that we can uh, get involved, uh, please let me know or talk directly to Chris. Thanks.